What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to the HQ. It's your man's Nicholas. Big dogs gotta eat BDGE fantasy football, whether you're joining us on YouTube, whether you're joining us via the podcast. Welcome back, and I love y'all. It is Thursday, so we are doing another fan submitted Q&A sit start trade question episode. Now, last week I did the trade targets, and I think what I'm gonna do is just alternate Q and A's one Thursday. Next Thursday will be trade targets. Next Thursday after that will be Q and A. So the odd weeks are gonna be Q and A. The even weeks will be trade targets. I don't want to do trade targets every week. I don't think they're gonna tr change drastically week over week. And if they do, then you're probably you're doing bad analysis to begin with. Because if, if some guy moves from trade targets like sell high to buy low week over week, then you're not looking at it from the long term point of view anyway. So. I'll do it every other week just to keep it uh, a little mixed up for you guys. And I want to keep you guys engaged, of course. So if you want a chance for your question to be featured on week nine's Q&A, what you got to do is head over to the Big Dogs Facebook page. So it's facebook.com slash BDGE fantasy football. Make sure you like the page and then message your question through the Facebook page messenger all you got to do is ask your question make sure you use any information that i need the matchups the scoring type and that kind of shit and make sure you finish your question with a hashtag answer my zam question with a z do not forget that that is crucial that being said we're going to dive into week seven's fan submitted q a's <laughs> First question is from my man, Maid. He asks, I'm in a half PPR league. I own DeAndre Hopkins. I'm being offered Le'Veon Bell and Will Fuller for Hopkins. The Le'Veon owner is a diehard Cincy fan, so that's why he's trying to get rid of him because he refuses to play him. He traded for Le'Veon in hopes of getting traded. He's 6-0 without Le'Veon, so I'm scared that Hopkins is going to make his team too good. What should I do? Hashtag answer my Zam question. So this uh, completely revolves around Bell and his status, right? I mean, damn, imagine being 6-0 while drafting Le'Veon Bell. You must be feeling pretty damn good right now. Pretty zam good right now, excuse me. So the only information we have to work with, right? We have, we have to figure out the information at hand. And the most recent report about Le'Veon Bell is the fact that he was supposed to report for the week seven buy. The week seven buy is taking place right now. Le'Veon Bell has been nowhere to be seen. Despite all the reports that he was going to be coming back during the week seven bye, the team has consistently said they have not heard from Le'Veon Bell whatsoever, and they have no idea whether or not he's going to return. Mike Tomlin hasn't heard from him, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. He is not on the Steelers facility. So I don't know if he's going to return this week. I have no idea if he's going to return next Monday, but as we're looking at it right now, we can still probably assume that it is going to be a week 10 return for Le'Veon Bell. Bell, right? That's, you know, given the information at hand, that is the only thing we can assume. He sat out this far, so we have to assume that since he's not at the facility, he's going to continue to sit out. And I don't think you can treat it otherwise unless we hear something otherwise. So for the time being, that being said, having DeAndre Hopkins for those extra, you know, week seven, eight, nine, ten games, opposed to having Le'Veon Bell sitting on your bench is going to make or break the deal. So for this reason, uh, I'm going to keep DeAndre Hopkins here because he's going to be so much more valuable to you than Bell sitting on the bench. The other thing that makes me nervous, of course, is the fact that when Le'Veon Bell returns, like, is he going to be the bell cow here again? We've heard reports from his teammates, from James Conner's teammates, that he deserves a role when Le'Veon Bell returns, especially from Big Ben, which is obviously a big stance of indictment from um, from Ben. You know, if he's saying, if the starting quarterback is saying that he's earned a role, then he probably should have a role. That being said, like, is it going to be a 50-50 split when Bell comes back? Is it going to be even 70-30 in favor of Bell, which would still be a pretty drastic drop-off from the 95% of touches that Bell has previously seen in the previous years, right? So if he's dropping down from about 95% to 70% touches, that's going to hurt his value. And he's not, you know, that top three pick that you thought Bell was going to be um, coming into the year. Connor's been very good on the goal line as well. Does Connor take that goal line role? I believe he's converted six of his 10 goal line rushes into touchdowns, which is a pretty good rate. So, you know, you got to look at a lot of the different moving parts here, and all of them are red flags for Le'Veon Bell. So for that reason, I would definitely be keeping DeAndre Hopkins in this case. Thank you for that question. Question number two from Kevin was good, Kevin. Looking like Andy Dalton in your Abby pick was good. PPR format, week seven, hashtag fix my flex. Philip Lindsay at Arizona or Corey Clement home versus Carolina. Also, do you think Calvin Ridley is still worth holding on to in spite of two dud games, an ankle injury, and Sanu stealing touchdowns and targets? Hashtag answer my Zam 
question. Now, I think in terms of your flex, this is a, a pretty good problem to have between Lindsey and Corey Clement in a PPR league. Now, they're two good running backs with two good matchups, and they should be handling the majority of the touches in their respective backfields. Arizona, you know, Lindsey's going against Arizona. Arizona has been awful against running backs uh, on the year, but Carolina has not been great either. And I'm going to lean Clement here in week seven, because I think coming into week seven, I think he's going to start to take more of the feature role in this backfield over Wendell Smallwood for this week and, uh, and, and going forward, right? In week six, Smallwood ended up playing on 62% of the Eagle snaps compared to, I think it was 37% for Clement. And Smallwood actually outcarried him 18 to 11. However, Smallwood was not efficient in a large workload. Turned those 18 carries into 51 yards, which is 2.9 yards per carry. And we also heard news right before the game that Clement was going to be on a limited snap count, right? Because he just missed two games due to an injury, right? And the Eagles smartly rested him, even though he probably could have played in week six. Minnesota, Jacksonville, take notes on how to properly rest your players until they were 100% healed. Clement came into the game 100% ready to go, but they did still want to scale him into the workload, which is why I think we saw Smallwood take the majority of touches and snaps. The other big reason here is that the Eagles were up, I think it was 24-6 uh, to 6 at halftime. They scored right away on that first drive in the third quarter. So they were up 31-6 to 6 with basically the entire second half ready to go. There was no reason to run Clement into the ground, and there's no reason to play him more than you should especially coming right up back off injury. So I would say that the fact that Smallwood got more touches than Clement is more fluky and game script specific than anything else, right? Prior to that, in the first half, Clement was getting a lot of work. He was getting a lot of touches. He got multiple goal line carries. He got a target on the on the goal line as well. He was being used a lot, um, which tells you that he is the goal line back with their first team offense. He also caught all three of his targets for 26 yards. Wendell Smallwood, on the other hand, got two targets, only caught one of them, didn't have a single yard on either of those targets. Um, so I think what this says is Clement is the goal line back. Clement is also going to be heavily involved, if not way more involved than Smallwood in the passing game. And I think, as I said, there's no reason to run him into the ground here because of the game script. And I think they rested him. And I think going forward, Clement is going to split the carry workload, if not hold the majority of workload going forward over Smallwood. For that reason, I will take Clement here. Um, I think they're going to use him a lot against the Panthers. And I think you see him overtake the starting role here and get a majority of the touches in the passing game, especially for PPR. That's obviously huge as long as Darren Sproles continues to be out, which who knows when his return is. So give me Clement in this situation. As for uh, Calvin Ridley, I mean, I'm not necessarily looking to move on from him, right? I'm not like happy about dropping him. But with bye weeks approaching, um, you know, you might be desperate. So I'm not, I'm not telling you to hold on to him that you have to hold on to him. But it depends, you know, it depends on who you're picking up for him, of course. Like I would rather have his teammate Ido Smith at this point than him. But at the same time, I think people's expectations just got way too high on Ridley during that stretch, right? He was scoring a ridiculous amount of touchdowns. And as we know, touchdowns are extremely volatile week to week. And they're not something that's predictive. And there's not something that you can depend on, right? They're unrealistic to expect week over week touchdowns from Calvin Ridley. So the only thing you could really um, look at when it comes to fantasy guys or, or fantasy players, right? And predicting their success, their future success is the usage here. And looking at Ridley every single week of the season so far, he has been third in snaps behind Sanu, behind uh, Julio Jones. So Ridley was never creeping into that wide receiver two, wide receiver one role for the Falcons. He just happened to be hitting on a few deep deep balls and a lot of the touchdowns, which make him seem way more valuable than he actually is in terms of usage. So he was already playing behind both of those guys. He was seeing on average just 60% of the snaps for the Falcons week over week. Um, and he had also seen more than five targets just twice in their six games. So only on 33% of their games has he seen five or more targets. So that's not very inspiring. So basically your expectations should never have really gotten that high to begin with. So if you need to drop uh, Calvin Ridley here, I'm not opposed to it. I don't think he's a must drop or anything like that, but good question. Uh, good question, Kevin. Question number three comes from Brandon. Was good, Nick. Before I ask my question, I just want to say I appreciate the hard work and dedication you put into fantasy football. Right back at you. I appreciate all the uh, the support that I get from you guys, all the comments, the questions, um, any of that stuff. So that being said, if you like the video, if I've helped you out this year, I would very much appreciate a thumbs up for the video. You can comment down below with your question. I'll try to get around to your sit starts and whatnot. And subscribe to the channel if you're new. We're doing videos like this every week. Y'all know the deal. His question is, the flex position. In your opinion, who should I start between Alshon Jeffrey versus the Panthers and Al Robinson versus the Patriots? 
10 team full PBR league hashtag answer my Zam question. Now this is an interesting one considering the matchups. Now we have the top two wide receivers, Jeffrey and Robinson on their respective teams going against two defenses that deploy shadow coverage from their top cornerbacks against the opposing team's top wide receiver. So Alshon Jeffrey against the Panthers is going to get James Bradbury. Looking at this, James Bradbury has shadowed Julio, AJ Green, Odell, and Josh Doxson this year. So as you can see, for the most part, Bradbury has been okay, if not good, right? He performed very well against Julio Jones and A.J. Green. Then he got worked by Odell Beckham. He shut down Josh Doxson, which shouldn't really impress anyone, but Jeffrey in his own right has been very good. Since returning from the injury, he's clearly been the wide receiver one of Philly, but he's been a top eight fantasy wide receiver over the last three weeks, over uh, averaging over 16 fantasy points per game in half PPR leagues over that span. Um, he's averaging nearly 10 targets a game, six receptions, over 70 receiving yards, and he has scored three times in three games. But let's look at Allen Robinson. Now he goes against the New England Patriots, where he will get Stephon Gilmore. Now Gilmore has been very good. You can see that he pretty much shut down Hopkins. He shadowed Dante Moncrief, which was kind of a surprise. He shadowed Marvin Jones, and then Sammy Watkins last week. So I think Gilmore is a much tougher matchup than James Bradbury is. And looking at Robinson, Robinson hasn't been great as a fantasy wide receiver. I mean, he has scored in each of his last two games, but he's only passed 64 receiving yards once this year. His his yardage total is not inspiring at all. His, his target numbers are not great either. Um, he's not getting many of the valuable looks that we had hoped Robinson was getting, right? He has just two targets inside the opposing 10-yard line on the year which is where he basically made his money in Jacksonville, right? He's a high point, high jump, like grab the ball on fade type routes and uh, and in the end zone type of guy. And he's just not getting those look this year because all of Trubisky's, I think Trubisky's success is going to end up starting to, you know, veer its head back down to the norm. He's not going to keep, keep putting up the games that he has been over the last few weeks because he's been connecting on so many deep balls. His touchdowns are deep passes. Um, he's hooking up with Taylor Gabriel and things like that. So Robinson's not really seeing the deep balls. He's not seeing the looks in the end zone. And, uh, you know, thinking back on last week, right, we saw the Patriots and the Chiefs. Great showdown, right? Great, great, great game. Fun game to watch. We saw that Stephon Gilmore was on Watkins. Watkins got completely shut down last week. Now, that lends you to Tyreek Hill, who had a huge game, right? Connecting on deep balls, exploding against the Patriots. Now we have Taylor Gabriel, right? And we have Matt Nagy, who was the previous offensive coordinator for the Chiefs. He knew how to use Tyreek Hill, and I assume he's going to deploy Taylor Gabriel in the same way that he uh, deployed Tyreek Hill, and the same way that Tyreek Hill was deployed last week against the Patriots. So you could, you could think that Taylor Gabriel might be a much bigger part of the game plan this week um, than Allen Robinson. So with that being said, uh, I like... Jeffrey here. I will definitely roll with Jeffrey over Allen Robinson. I think he's just a better wide receiver overall uh, with a better quarterback in a better situation, a better offense with a better defensive matchup. So give me Jeffrey over Robinson here. If you guys in the audience have any questions regarding, you know, just wide receivers to start, running backs to start, quarterbacks to start, whatever, just rankings in general, I do weekly rankings, which you could check out on patreon.com slash BDGE. You will have to subscribe to me on Patreon. Um, but it's a way to support your favorite creators, and I hope to be one of your favorite creators. If I'm not, I hope by the end of the season that your man's is. Um, but that's how you get all of my weekly rankings on patreon.com slash BDGE. I also do a live stream every week. It's a private live stream for my patrons only, which will take place tonight or you know, last night it would have taken place already. Every Wednesday night I do a live stream where I answer all of your questions that you might have, as well as the community forum on Patreon where you can ask any of your questions and uh, other like-minded people answer your questions as well as myself. So you can check me out, patreon.com slash BDGE. Let's move into question number four from my man Pete. He says, John Brown versus Saints or Tevin Coleman at New York Giants? PBR, answer my Zam question. So Johnny Brown, Johnny Smokey Brown has got arguably the best matchup that a fantasy wide receiver can have in week seven. Playing at home against the New Orleans Saints. This is a 50 point over under, so there are a lot of points expected to be scored. Uh, I believe the Ravens are minus two and a half, so they are expected to score about 26 or 27 team points. Now, the Saints are allowing the single most fantasy points to opposing wide receivers on the year, and it's because of their cornerback play, right? Brown will be running the majority of his routes against Ken Crawley and PJ Williams. PJ Williams is their slot cornerback. Um, Brown runs 26% of his routes from the slot. P.J. Williams is currently the lowest graded slot cornerback in the entire NFL per PFF. Ken Crawley is the eighth worst graded outside cornerback per PFF. 
Now, if the Ravens are smart this week, and judging by the way that they continually use Suck Allen, they are not smart. But if they were, if they decided to stop messing around and be smart for once, they would deploy John Brown heavily in the slot this week to take advantage of the speed mismatch between Brown and P.J. Williams. Brown is obviously that 4-3, 40-yard dash kind of guy. Williams, on the other hand, runs like a 4-5-7, a 4-6-40. So there's a huge speed mismatch in the middle of the field from the slot. Um, either way, Brown is going to be seeing a lot of Crawley and a lot of P.J. Williams, which are both very, very advantageous matchups to John Brown in Week 7. You look at the type of uh, wide receivers that have had success against the Saints secondary this year, right? It is those long ball guys. It's those speed, down-the-field type guys. Deshaun Jackson, 5 for 146 and two touchdowns. Mike Evans, 7 for 147 and a touchdown. Had a bunch of deep balls connected with uh, Ryan Fitzpatrick in week one as well. Antonio Callaway even, 3 for 81 and a tutty. Calvin Ridley, 7 for 146 and his three touchdown game came against the Saints. So you see it's a lot of these connections deep down the field. Brown obviously is that guy for the Raven. He fits those wide receivers, that category perfectly. Uh, and I know he's coming off his worst game of the year, right? He caught two of three targets, 428 yards. But that was the first time that we've seen him see less than fewer than seven targets over the last five games. They were up 24-0. There was no reason for them to take deep shots down the field. There was no reason for Brown to be involved like he had been um, in that game. So I think it was just bad, bad game script. We see a big bounce back from Brown in week seven. Now, Tevin Coleman, I think, is a very strong flex option as well. And you could argue that he's actually safer than Brown, and it might depend on how you want to deploy your lineup, if you're looking for more upside, if you're looking for more safety. But the snap split between Coleman and rookie Ido Smith were alarmingly close last week if you're a Coleman owner. Coleman saw 57% of the snaps, Ido Smith 46% of the snaps. Ido has been vulturing a lot of work from Coleman since uh, Freeman has been injured and is obviously out for the remainder of the season, or at least on the IR for the next eight weeks. Over the last three weeks, Ito has seen the same number of tar uh, as targets, same number of targets as Coleman has over the last three weeks. And Ito even outcarried Coleman last week, 11 to 10. And it's not like it was a game that was out of hand and they were like, oh, we're going to rest Coleman or whatever. That's you know, a, a snap split and a carry split that we might see going forward. So Coleman might not be that RB1 that we expected with Freeman to be out. Edel Smith also has 14 red zone carries on the season. Coleman only has seven red zone carries on the season. Devonta Freeman only three. He's obviously missed a bunch of time, but the red zone split is kind of concerning as well if you're having Coleman owner because Edel Smith has been getting in the end zone. He's getting those red zone touches. They both have five carries inside the 10 yard line. And outside of Kamara, who absolutely, you know, whacks the Giants ass in, in week four, the Giants have been pretty good at stopping opposing runners, guys who get get the majority of carries for the opposing team. So I don't I think Coleman is a sneaky play to actually fade in week seven. So I'll definitely go with John Brown here. Question five is from Alex. Full PPR. Who should I start in my flex? John Brown versus the Saints, Philip Lindsay versus the Cardinals. So luckily for me, I've kind of already broken down both of these guys and their outlooks for what I see them doing in week seven. Both guys have a have you know, have a, a gorgeous matchup. Now, while Lindsey has actually out-touched his backfield mate, Royce Freeman, in every game so far this season, outside of the game he got, you know, kicked out for, for punching a dude, over the last two weeks, Freeman has actually out-snapped Lindsey in each of their last two games. Now, I would 100, 1,000% rather have Lin own Lindsey than Freeman, right? That, that has no bearing on who I'd rather have on my team. Um, but it's possible that this is a game where the Broncos try to establish the ground and pound and establish the run because they have been hurting through the air. It hasn't looked good for Case Keenum. And you look at the backs that have had success against the Cardinals this year. It's not necessarily the versatile pass catching backs. It's the grinders like Adrian Peterson, uh, Jordan Howard, Mike Davis, um, Latavius Murray. Todd Gurley had three goal line touchdowns against them as well. Um, and, you know, Latavius Murray last week had 155 yards on the ground against them. So, you know, I could be totally wrong here. And Lindsey could have a, have a great game. It is a great matchup, but I wouldn't be surprised to see the Broncos really try to focus on the ground game, which means Freeman should have uh, a good game if they're trying to grind between the tackles here. And it would be, of course, at the expense of Philip Lindsey. So given Brown's ridiculously good matchup, I'm going to go with the Ravens pass catcher here over Philip Lindsay in week seven. So I hope that helps you out. And uh, that's going to be the last question for this Q&A mailbag episode. Again, if you want to uh, try to get onto week nine's episode, facebook.com slash BDGE fantasy football. If you enjoyed the episode, a thumbs up would be highly appreciated. If you're on the podcast, a rating and review, I would appreciate a five-star review, but anything, any 
constructive criticism, you know, your boy can work with. I appreciate that. I always appreciate you sticking around with me. Any comments down below, your CISAR questions, drop them down there. And I'll see y'all on Saturday for my top DFS of the week. Hey, peace.